Hello, 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 hello. And it's time again for a couple of juicy pitches from our glorious startups here at our virtual Pitch Tuesday. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, from Julia and from me. Hello. Hello, everyone. From my side as well, my name is Julia. And together we, with Ole, we will be your uh, facilitators and moderators for tonight's show. Um, tonight, uh, tonight, the stage belongs to our amazing startups. We are going to listen to three of them that will pitch their business ideas. So each startup will, will have five minutes time to present their idea, which will be followed by a brief Q&A. Keep in mind that your feedback and questions are very much appreciated and they really represent the gold that the startups can carve out of these events. Uh, after our presentation, uh, we will ask you to stay tuned and we will be asking you for your favorite pitch and favorite idea with an online call. Don't forget that you can always type in questions here on YouTube and we will uh, live ask, it, ask them to the founders. Yes, and we can try that out, whether you're fully aware of that function right now. Um, so just one question, where are you based right now? From where in this world are you watching our show? Please type this in to our uh, comment section and so everyone knows who's there. Yeah, we uh, kindly welcome you also on behalf of APX, which is uh, this fantastic uh, accelerator program hosting all our teams. Uh, APX is an early stage uh, investor uh, based in Berlin. Uh, up for now, uh, we have a portfolio of uh, more than 50 startups and it's growing and growing. And the idea is that uh, the startups apply here and then they get uh, all the love and all the care from the team, all the consultation to help them grow their business. Um, and uh, then being able to get uh, even more investment and grow further in the future. Uh, there's a fantastic team of uh, 16 people supporting the startup and uh, also a very large network of uh, consultants, of coaches, and um, yeah, just people in the network who support the startup to grow. Uh, if you decide to apply for APX, that would be amazing. You can just uh, write as a mail to hello at apx.ac. Um, if you're looking for an accelerator program, it would be great to hear from you. And then the deal is, uh, is very founders friendly. It's 5% uh, of your equity for 50,000 euros. And uh, maybe we'll be welcoming you in the near future here at our program. It would be fantastic. And having said that, uh, Julia, I would say it's time for our first startup. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's, Let's do it. Let's start it. Let's get them over onto our virtual stage. Uh, we all know it. Um, at the moment, uh, as we are all locked in, uh, it's pretty hard uh, to yeah to um, up into other further education possibilities or to get trained new skills for a new job. At least not in the traditional model of a classroom. And uh, this now is exactly the time for um, a startup like the next one that we're going to present to you, Octa. And Octa offers um, fantastic uh, virtual and very immersive education to train uh, skills or um, the employees whenever they start something new. How exactly that works? We are going to uh, hear from Henry Huselstein. Henry is the COO of Octa and a co-founder and it's his time to get on stage. Hello, Henry, how are you doing? Very good, and you? Very good. Uh, Henry, um, everything turned uh, virtual and we're excited to hear your pitch right now and then later on discuss what that means for your startup and for your offering. So Julia, I would say we now hand over the stage to Henry. We do it. Perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, yes, so today what I want to do is I want to share with you for the very first time publicly uh, an update on Okta 2.0. We've just released. We're super excited um, to, to give you a little bit of background. Together with my two co-founders, um, Daniel and Elias, uh, we founded Okta back in the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, we've been working together as a team for a couple of years um, on enterprise software projects. 
um, and to understand why what we today call Okta 2.0, um, we need to have a quick look back at where we started. Um, our vision and our mission with the company is that we believe that automating industrial trainings is a scaling problem of immersive technologies. And we simply, with our software, want to create uh, the gap and bridge the gap between um, true immersive technology, uh, let's say, um, outbreak into industrial companies today. So where did we start? We started with version 1.0. Basically, we had step-by-step -step instructions that we could put on an augmented reality headset. Uh, we created a content management system, and um, we then ventured into how can we maybe integrate IoT data into this? Um, how can we do dry training? This was version 1.2. Uh, and lastly, version 1.3, we did actually merge the physical and the, the augmented world together with hands-on training. But what I've seen over the now one and a half years that we've been working on this, it's two things. The one is the, uh, the headsets and the, the displays that you need to actually access this information are very expensive. It's still very hard for companies to roll it out at scale. And at the same time, for uh, for, a learn, for a trainee to actually be able to revisit what he has done it's simply impossible to request that people have hardware at their home or whatever. So this is really why we have understood that it is time to bridge the gap from um, simple pilots or nice marketing stunts with AR or VR technology to what we now call Okta 2.0. Basically, a truly device agnostic, flexibly scalable platform for immersive content. Basically, let's look at an example. Let's say I am a medical assistant. We are working in Corona times. I have to actually understand how a ventilation machine works. Well, basically I haven't been trained. I've never seen a machine before, but there are patients who need my help. So I can waste time searching for an answer. I can simply be confused and do nothing. Or if I'm very lucky, I have an expert around that I can interrupt who can show me what to do. But basically what we have really tried to do and also really try to visualize with our demo that you will see in a second is how can somebody know how to do their job the right way when they are actually in need of knowing this? So you can think of our solution as on-demand knowledge, also a solution that obviously can come in when you train before you actually need to do it, and it simply scales beautifully across the organization. So let's have a look at what version 2.0 is looking like. You can simply open the link of the training on any device. Let's say you open it on a smartphone. You can interact with the model. You basically have the capability of opening on a laptop, tablet, whatever. Um, and at the same time, if I open this and I have an Oculus or a Steam headset or I have a, an AR headset, I simply open the same link that was once created and look at the same content in the fully immersive version. So as an end user, I basically start off looking for information. In this case, for example, I find it in my service portal, then get access to it through the protected link that is and basically delivered through our content engine. And it is delivered in the right level of immersiveness on the device that I have. So a smartphone or a headset, whatever. Um, the training was created with our offering tool in combination with our plugin that uses uh, Blender, which is a three-dimensional, a uh, 3D um, object um, software. And it is based on the 3D models that was given to us by, in this case, for example, the respiration uh, ventilation device uh, company. So what is so beautiful about the fact that we can integrate and distribute the link, um, and with that, the training itself, um, on the level of immersiveness that you want, is that you can simply add the link or a QR code into your product manuals. You can publish as a new module on your e-learning service portal. Um, you can simply make it part of an assignment in your learning management system that you maybe already have. Or you simply share the training with your class via email or any other channel. Or last but not least, you can also simply add it into your product lifecycle management system and even make your operations better with the same link that you have created once that scales throughout your organization. 
Why is it so important that we do this? Um, if we had only focused our solution on AR or VR devices, we would have not been able to reach as many people as today. We found that if we do actually make our platform truly device agnostic and uh, scale immersive content across the different devices, we can reach up to 3,225 times more people than if we simply only provide, let's say, a single VR or a single AR solution. What is also incredibly powerful is the fact that through our platform, you're going to standardize how training is created and consumed. Um, we know that from research, on average, companies can expect to reduce their cost of training by 15% in just two years if they start standardizing through immersive content. So how do we work with our clients? Um, we usually start by identifying the business case behind investing into our platform. We then draw out the pilot and vision roadmap. We execute and deliver the platform, the product, in four to eight weeks. And then we measure on the KPIs that the company actually wants to prove the fact that with our platform, training becomes more effective and efficient. At the same time, what is super exciting today is that we can simply work with anyone who already started with VR. Basically, we can take an existing VR training, we can evaluate it, and we can scale it down so that within a couple of weeks, your existing work actually scales away from, let's say, your existing 10 to 15 Oculus headsets that you have in your training center onto the devices of all of your employees at the same time. With that, we basically have two different products and services. Our play license basically allows companies to get licenses for their trainees at 10 euros per trainee per month. At the same time, if the company wants to, they can use our creator license and with that actually start building the trainings themselves, which is priced at around 3,000 euros per year. Or we can offer to start off with the company by creating the first training from scratch or by converting uh, an existing training into a scaling training solution. So we invite every one of you to come by our website or simply put this link into your browser, try out our demo, have a look at it, and please reach out to us if you feel this can actually add value to your company as well. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, Harry. Um, listening to you, um, I'm, I'm, I was just thinking that uh, what, what you do is actually what people have been talking about across all industries for such a long time. But the, the evolution has taken some time. And now, with the current situation going on, do you feel that you are at the right time in the right place? Yeah, um, so obviously a few factors come together. I think everyone realizes that if they haven't yet put, let's say, simply digital learning solutions in place, Training has been, physical training has been stopped for now two and a half months, maybe three months already. So nobody gets trained. And that is, of course, obviously, you know, like we can be there and say, hey, yeah, yeah okay, you should have worked with us. But what is more important is that um, at the same time, what happened is that with a new standard, so our solution is built on a standard that's called WebXR. This has been released in the beginning of the year. Um, well, let's say it has been uh, broadly released in the beginning of the year. It's supported by all of your browsers that you have. Um, and with that release, we could actually technically realize what we had been planning for such a long time. So it's a very, obviously a very nice um, yeah, coincidence that this happens at the same time. And we have a question from Dr. Juni Goldwasser. And he asks, can you also have tests on the system so that people can only be allowed to use a device after they have proven they know how to use it. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand this correctly. So the device would be your personal device or the training? Maybe I can try and interpret it a bit. So um, maybe if it is with regards to security, then we can obviously limit um, the amount of, of uh, you know, like uh, people who can open it. Um, we can have individual links per user. So, um, and through that, for example, I think this may, might be what he means. Uh, we can, for example, also limit 
um, the up or down scaling. So if, for example, somebody who doesn't know how to use the Oculus headset, um, maybe because he gets dizzy really fast, uh, we could obviously simply make it a two-dimensional experience even in the in the Oculus uh, 3D space, but it's then only flat, so to say. Yeah, that would be possible. Okay. I'm not sure if I have to do it correctly, Yoni. You can shoot me a Slack message after. <laughs> And then we have one more question from Diego that says, hi, Eric, great stuff. I'm wondering what are the main verticals that you are targeting? Also, what are the main challenges that you, that you face while creating these digital twins? So obviously we didn't choose the respiratory machine uh, you know, by chance. Um, with, with the current situation, um, you know, we, we were thinking about, okay, where can we actually build something that creates value today? Um, so we started out with who needs help on introducing new functionalities and products um, really quickly into the market. And obviously, um, the medical sector is interesting for us because um, let's hope it doesn't happen. But, you know, like if actually we run into a situation where people need to be trained really, really quickly to operate, let's say, a ventilation machine at scale, um, you're not going to be able to do that with people going into hospitals explaining what to do. You will need to be digital in this case. So. Um, you know, like this, this makes a lot of sense for us right now. Um, the second thing is we're not creating the digital twins. So this obviously is a limitation in itself with who we can work with. Um, we need to have access to the existing data. Uh, however, obviously, um, anyone who does any type of production today um, moved into three-dimensional spaces. Um, there, you know, the pen and paper is, is long gone. So. Um, we can expect any company who wants to work with us to actually have um, the underlying 3D data. And then obviously we need to render it down. And Maximilian van I wants to know, how big is the market of training conversion? Um, so obviously we cannot convert, let's say, the complex interactive you know, VR where, okay, there is a reindeer flying through the, you know, through the image and there's a lot going on. Um, so this in itself limits what we can convert, but we can convert any type of training that is what we would define as standardizable training anyways. So any type of training that is a combination of a 3D model and a step-by-step -step instruction that we can simply merge through our platform. Um, so I would say globally, it is any type of training that exists that can be scaled down in this way. There's no limit really. Great, thank you very much, yeah. Henry. Um, and uh, we'd kindly ask you to wait in our backstage area um, for the final voting. Thank you, bye. Kiss you later. Um. <laughs> I think you're removing Henry and I'm removing <laughs> So we have to make a decision who is going to do what now. You can do it. I stopped doing it. So yeah. I, I would say I try to remove Henry from our yeah. virtual stage and you do the introduction for our next startup. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. I agree. Bye-bye, Henry. <laughs> well, then we move on uh, with our next startup. And we talk about ports this time and how actually um, they move the world, or at least they move m products and the resources that we use on a regular basis at home and also in all kinds of industries. Um, although we are witnessing a demand for a quicker and cleaner logistics. Marine Digital, which is a startup that we are about to meet, believes in the transformation of ports to space of supply chain innovation through digitization. They originally come from Moscow, and now they are based in Riga. Ivan uh, has a background in banking, logistics, and IT. So let's welcome him to the stage to tell us more about Marine Digital. Hello, hey. Ivan. How Hi, guys. Nice, nice. <laughs> yes? It's a lot of sunny weather today. Oh, amazing. So, um, okay, we'll, we'll hand you over the stage now. Um, here is your presentation and uh, see you in five minutes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, my name is Ivan. Hello, everyone. Uh, in Marine Digital, we bridge the gap between innovation and maritime logistics with our product of fuel optimization. 
So if you could imagine the biggest ocean area in the world, this small city, uh, this small sea inside the city, it contains about 10 million liters inside. And this is the exact amount of the fuel burned out by average vessel per year. Basically, it's 850,000 tons of fuel burning every year. And this is only one vessel out of one, one, 100,000 vessels in the world. So we are dealing with the problem to reduce this fuel consumption and to prevent the fuel stealing in some interesting part of maritime logistics. Uh, today, we see the situation when uh, average fuel optimization system solved the problem only in parts. So we decided to focus on the complexity. Uh, the fuel consumption affected by a lot of factors. This is only five most important groups. And uh, average fuel optimization system uh, operates with only two factors outside of this group. Um, we decided uh, to do a simple step to build the best data set and to provide the most complex solution in the industry. So today we build a system that uh, finds the data and uh, provide the most complex data set to reduce your fuel consumption. Uh, you've got the option uh, to understand and analyze if you are going uh, the best and most optimal route. Uh, so our solution provides it. Next slide. Uh, you could choose the most effective route, and this is for a reason. Uh, because uh, with our calculations and tests, it's really possible to reduce the fuel consumption by 12% maximum. And this is 240,000 per year. We provide the hardware that installs to the vessel uh, within somehow 15 minutes, uh, lines the data, analyze it through the AI algorithms and streams the results and advices for the special route planning software. Uh, also, we uh, mine a lot of elementary data, provides offline GPS tracking and a lot of more functions. Uh, this, so this software is a typical SAS model. Uh, we're asking for 500k per month or 6k per year. With this my amount of money, uh, you could uh, offer yourself a one-stop shop with the most complex uh, and necessary functions that could be easily installed within 15 minutes and uh, to test it uh, for free for two months. Uh, next slide. Uh, we're testing the solution within the pilot with one of the uh, big companies inside the maritime market. And we have already started the process of uh, client acquisition uh, of 600 persons, the vessel signed the partnership agreement with the industry company. Uh, the market we are working with is really huge. So basically today, with the lowest fuel prices ever, it's uh, somewhere around 200 billion per year. And uh, with our options to reduce the fuel consumption by 10%, it's easy to calculate uh, the estimation. Uh, we chase our clients through four most Important channels today we have already tested. It's the direct channel, partners, industry portals, and industry events. We have tested it for one year and uh, already got some results. Uh, the competitors landscape on this slide is uh, rather simplified, uh, but still we see the particular niche where we can uh, provide the most functional and complex solution with affordable price. To do it, we run around today uh, for 350k to finalize the relocation to Northern Germany region and to go around day within one year. Uh, we have already started the acceleration program uh, with APX, uh, boarded our first client in April, uh, closed the 70k investments uh, in the beginning or in the middle of April, and uh, we will apply for IP rights registration in the middle of June next month in parallel with the key relocation. Next April, we plan to launch the solution mass market and go around the cost scaling. The core team is already inside, so we will advance uh, our team with a couple data scientists and a couple of developers to proceed further. Uh, the advisory network is already on board. We got a strong 
industry advisory related to the, uh, for example, charts committee or for like uh, industry related sales agency. Next. Uh, the partner network that we built during 2019 helps us to expand in the central European market and on Baltics. Thanks for your time. Um, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Ivan. Ivan, um, you slightly pivoted, uh, as we can see. Now you focus on fuel, um, this fuel optimization uh, system. Uh, can you give us a bigger bit of background about that? Uh, basically, during 2019, uh, we have made a huge customer development cycle, uh, searching for the most scalable and big niche. We have tested perhaps four hypotheses. And in the beginning of 2020, uh, we were totally sure that uh, this is the best way for us uh, to scale the company and to build the most important solution uh, that we are focused on today. Uh, fuel optimization niche is much more scalable because, uh, first of all, uh, we have already reached uh, several customers with only, only two months. That is not really possible inside the maritime industry, where the sales, where the sales cycle is like super huge. <laughs> yeah, so we did our best. And the second part is that uh, we also today focusing on the uh, high tech with the AI algorithms for route planning and also for green technology, which is uh, super important basically with our apply climate change. So this is, uh, I think, the simplified background of the current situation. I would have a second uh, follow-up question. So, and uh, how did your first uh, the prospects then react to your solution? Um, react for our solution. So, um, I don't really know because uh, at the moment we see the strong market request for, uh, for for this part of the solution. From the other hand, we also build the complex product. So it's not only the algorithm and the hardware itself. We are transforming the vessel uh, to the digital data market where it's possible to update your current state of the old vessel with the simplified software and the hardware to the modern one. And to have all metrics uh, instantly and etc. So basically we meet the market request. So we can, we can see that our clients willing to have this solution even if they are like slow a little bit and etc but still like we see that it's uh, progress mm -hmm. okay thank you even we have a question from Jörg, managing director of apx asking how much effort is it to install your solution per vessel how much effort is to install a solution per vessel um basically um we think that um still we need to test uh, several different uh, types of for the vessels uh, because at this uh, current stage uh, we, we still need to spend and to finalize the R&D cycle uh, because lots of them today. For example, 70% of the market still got no digital equipment on board, so it's analog. And uh, to be sure that we got the most, uh, that, that our solution covers every type of the vessel and uh, covers every type of internal operations. We are testing uh, several different types of the clients. Um, the installation cycle and uh, like the, the process of the relations to the clients uh, shows that uh, it depends on the particular company sometimes. And we are focusing on the most progressive one at the moment. So in general, it, it takes not so long to proceed. We have one final question from Jonathan Eat. This is really very interesting indeed. How does it fare versus, for example, AP Muller's proprietary tool? Mm, we need to clarify the particular tool. Uh, our current market research, uh, today we have 100 metrics on uh, almost every existing market solution related to the fuel consumption, shows that, uh, like, in average, 
maybe even this particular tool operates with only a couple of uh, important data metrics. For example, I can mention Wartzela because it's the most well-known company in this market. Uh, they used to develop and uh, to produce the engines. So uh, they, they, they got the data scientists that tell us that uh, engine, engine uh, parameters is the most important for the fuel consumption. From the other hand, for example, we got uh, several competitors like uh, Stormgear. Uh, which used to work with the uh, weather predictions. So today, their data, data scientist says uh, that uh, the weather is the most important factor that affects it, the fuel consumption. Basically, the truth is somewhere in the middle. So we, we combine all of the important factors together. We connect them to the root planning system. And also, we connect them to the data analytics uh, built on our own. So I don't think uh, that uh, AP Miller's uh, system got all these functions, and especially the data mining devices, which are rare in the industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe there, there's another very interesting question, but a very short answer, please, uh, Ivan. It's uh, from William Perch. Uh, in later phases, could this be applied to smaller boats? I know skippers transfer hundreds of thousands of sailboats across continents every year to have them ready for tourist season. Uh, we need to test it, but I think the, the high, uh, the, there's a high variety that it will be useful even for smaller vessels. Great. Thank you very much, Eva. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. So, and we come to our final startup. And if you are an investor into startups, you know that uh, this can be sometimes a very hackly experience. Uh, if you're a business angel, uh, maybe even more if you need to pool others and uh, then be investing into startups to help them grow and just uh, supply them with the, the money they need. Our next team is called Equity Hub. Uh, actually founded by two lawyers, Martin and Philip, uh, based here in Berlin. And uh, they had a look at the market and the current situation, how startup investments are done. And they actually came up with a pretty fine solution on how to structure this better in a digital way. Uh, please give it up for Philip from Equity Hub. Hello, Philip. Hi there. I hope everyone and can hear me. Philip uh, just revealed before the session that he has read every single book which is standing behind him and he knows most lines by memory, right? That's absolutely right. Totally right. Is that very important as a as a I'm going to recite I'm going to recite all of them now so you better settle in for the next 5 the years in 15 days. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll uh, then uh, show your slides as well, and we'll see you again in five minutes. Philip from Equity Hub. Thank you for your kind introduction, Olin. At Equity Hub, we are committed to substantially enhancing the funding experience of business angel pools and startups around the globe. Our vision is to make entrepreneurial private investing in startups as easy and as fun as investing in traditional asset classes, such as your good old stock portfolio. Now, business angels play an immense role in the financing of startups. In 2019, three quarters of all active startup investors in Germany were actually angels. And there are actually also many of them in absolute numbers. The count of seed capital private investors in Europe alone is estimated at approximately 350,000, up by more than 40% since 2011. And they are group creatures with numbers reaching up to 80% who prefer to invest alongside other angels. However, as corporate lawyers, both my co-founder and Martin and I uh, have witnessed close up the way funding is done these days, unnecessarily wasting the two most valuable resources of both startups and angels, time and money. The communication is messy, the information incomplete, the group dynamic unclear and the negotiation of terms unstructured, hindered by a lack of overview, knowledge and benchmarking. That is why we set out streamlining and simplifying the process, providing the knowledge, structure, and communication necessary for efficiency. And for our prototype, we picked the convertible loan process. It has been trending for the past few years and in Corona times in particular. 
but let's have a closer look at it, shall we? Imagine as an angel meeting a startup offline, you receive an invitation to invest in your email inbox. You head over to the profile, which holds all the relevant information for your investment, neatly structured for a quick and intuitive review. In case you like what you see, you can indicate your assessment of the terms and invite any buddies you might have to review the profile as well and maybe come along for the ride. Once the interested angels have then been placed in a pool and have selected a lead angel, their term indications are structured in order to be streamlined first among the angels and then negotiated with the startup. During this stage, we provide the parties with much needed benchmarking to enhance the negotiation of market standard terms, taking into account any market shifts. As soon as the terms are negotiated, the parties can either sign our convertible to go, you can see it here uh, as a CDG, which is drafted in a fair and balanced way and we believe should work just fine for 80% of transactions. Or they can agree on any amendments on our negotiation portal. Once the contract is signed digitally on the platform, the funds can be wired immediately through the usual integrated payment channels. And once the deal is closed, you can of course search our profile database, contact startups, or if you allow so, be approached by them to fund other rounds. For every startup that is added to the portfolio, the angel will regularly receive on-point efficient reporting in the spirit of that famous saying, if your startup isn't sending your monthly updates, it's probably going out of business. Now, looking at the market, conservative estimations of the volume of business angel funding in 2019 are up to approximately $16 billion, and they are projected to grow fivefold by the end of this decade. But we believe this status quo does not even fully account for another untapped segment of potential angels. Given the immense amounts of liquidity and the bank's zero interest rate versus the high rates of return for a diversified angel portfolio, the entrepreneurial thrill and maybe even the coolness factor that comes along with it, we observe a considerable and growing number of individuals with money, time, and long-standing industry expertise that are eager to enter the game. However, at the moment, these persons lack the scouting, the network, and the knowledge necessary to find, fund, and mentor great startups. It is therefore our midterm mission to activate this untapped pool of potential angels by empowering them with the structure and the knowledge and lead angel guidance to further foster the entrepreneurial ecosystem and together build great new companies. Our business model approach is based on three pillars that you should be able to see here now. I guess it's on the next slide, yeah. Um, a commission for funding rounds, a subscription fee for ongoing features such as investor relations, and an additional fee for selected auxiliary services, for example, the setting up of investment holding companies. Here you can see a depiction of the adjacent segments and companies that could be considered to be in our competitor landscape. It is important to note though that in one way or another, our approach is indeed different from each of the segments and the current businesses and their focus shown here. So where do we stand and where do we go from here? We have one slide that is a bit displaced, so I let me just go back. So where do we stand and where do we go from here? Having been accepted into APX program by the beginning of this year while still in the ideation phase and following our pivot that you heard about in the intro, uh, we were able to make substantial progress on the prototype, test it with an ever-growing number of interview partners and iterate and polish with a great team of product designers. And we are committed to best utilize the summer months to set up and close a funding round in order to tackle the MVP. And this is the founding team taking it to the next level. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we had a bit of a crevaffle in the last three slides. Uh, one of those that the, the roadmap was supposed to be the last before 
the last before last, but um, I, we managed. I guess this, this doesn't matter uh, too much, but it was uh, pretty clear. I would uh, bring your co-founder Martin also to the stage. Hello, Martin. Yes, hi everyone. Um, for the Q and A, um, maybe to, to to the both of you. Um, now you finished with your with your roadmap. Um, what is it that you're currently looking for? Philip, should I or do you? Go ahead. Okay. Well, we are uh, right now in the uh, in in the walkthrough process uh, with several interviews, both on the startup side and the investor side. And once we are done with that, we will of course uh, incorporate that into the prototype and the the journey and then the next thing will be that we will uh, try to get more funding by ourselves in order to to get the the money to to build the uh, the the uh, srs mm -hmm. okay. that's about it let's, let's maybe ask one of the questions here from the comments uh, i'll start with the one from yoni that asks is the enhanced transparency also work against the startup um, investors can prove. That is actually a topic that came up um, the, 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 you know, yesterday in our in our interview with one of the um, leading VC uh, advisors here in Berlin, who's also advising startups, and he said that, that he sees that is or he sees that to be like a big problem, and that we will really need to um, to to make clear to the startups that they actually in the end profit from this because what they time what they buy is time and money and um, we believe that by bundling the uh, the the angels on the on the investor side that the gain that they are tend to 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 profit from is uh, is much higher than maybe you know getting three percent or two percent of discount from one angel playing him against the other and so on so we believe that the streamlining and the um and the the, the focus um, in the long run, will will provide much more value. Maybe for for everyone uh, here to to understand what Yoni probably means. Um, these days, in in several cases, especially with regards to very experienced founders, they very often start negotiation with the uh, lead angel of a pool first, and then they kind of offer those negotiated terms to the other founders uh, saying, you know, uh, take this or leave it. And uh, so the question is, is, if we open the discussion to everyone, uh, is that then, uh, does it make the process more difficult for that kind of process? And as Philip says, we, we believe eventually it will make sense to, to be uh, open at that point, especially if you want to get unexperienced founders into the pool, I believe to have the, the um, not founders, sorry, um, investors, angels. Uh, business angels, to have the business angels talk to each other will, will bring the best input uh, you, you can get as a founder also. Okay. And we have another question from Daniel Huligin. Hi, Philip. Um, great presentation. Question, do you bundle all angels into one legal entity or does every angel show up as a line item on the cap table? Martin, that's your, that's your yeah. business. Well, as, as, as the lawyer always say, says, it uh, depends. Um, <laughs> the, the easy way is um, not to create a legal pool. Um, what we are, what Philip, the, the, the path shown by Philip is, uh, is, is the easy process, which we call factual pooling. And you are totally right. In this case, then uh, every single um, business angel would be shown in the cap table. It's, of course, no problem to, to out of that pool, create a legal pool. And again, there are different kinds of of ways you can can do that, um, but it's it's some are only an, an add-on, and that's of course something uh, we can offer uh, to the business angels, and we can can easily do. And once the once the startup moves into the next funding round, just one sentence, it's usually of course um, bundled anyway in a, in a legal pool. So yeah, that stands to happen at, at some later time in in any case. Okay, then one more question from uh, Justus who's asking, 
what are the prerequisites to be acknowledged as an angel? Can you invest with a regular income through your platform also? I could be cross -funded. What, the prerequisites I'd say is is is, uh, is is money funds. I think is a quite quite good first requisite prerequisite because obviously um, when I when I threw up the uh, competitors uh, landscape, you saw on the right side the um, you saw the crowdfunding platform. So we have equity crowdfunding, we have debt crowdfunding, and so on. And um, we actually always say that the crowdfunding. Or the segments are differentiated by way of level of investing, and the 300 or 500 euros that are um, pooled in a crowdfunding on a crowdfunding platform, and then just give you an indirect way of investing entrepreneurially and or not entrepreneurial, just investing indirectly into a startup, is different from the approach that we choose, where you go with bigger tickets, starting at let's say 10k, and um, and really then are shown on the cap table as we discussed earlier and um, are really active in an entrepreneurial, direct way. And another question from Tillman Kemper. Very clean pitch, like it a lot. How individualized are CLA contracts compared to simple templates? I'm not sure I understand this because it's, what do you mean by like, CLA, Martin, you obviously grasped it right away. Well, I, I believe uh, Tillman is addressing this sweet, uh, sweet spot, which we are actually trying to find. You know, usually you have a you have an uh, an template with maybe terms, and then just like an LOI, and then based on that, you try to negotiate the first terms, and you try to then reach a stage where you can have a look at the temp uh, at the contract, uh, the convertible loan agreement. And we do it a little bit separately. We believe we take into account those terms Philip uh, have have shown, um, and and because they cover eighty percent of the most crucial question when it comes to the terms of the final agreement. And when once the everyone involved agrees on that, it's much easier then to turn to the agreement because there will be no um, discussions then coming up at a very late uh, stage if, if that's what you are uh, if that's what you are trying to to address with your question tonight okay great uh, thank you very much guys uh, for your time and for your presentation Hola, Julia thank, thank you, you very much um, now it's time for um, the voting of you the audience you have to make your choice for mm -hmm. the best pitch that you saw and for the best idea. And therefore, we get uh, Henry and Ivan also back onto the stage. And we'd like to ask you, hello, how did they treat you in the backstage area? How were the drinks? No drinks were served. Very disappointing. No drinks. Again? <laughs> oh, but the expensive water. I told, uh, yeah, we will discuss that uh, after the show. Uh, we have to cut costs here. We have to be more efficient. No, <laughs> no more breaks. Uh, anyways, uh, so um, yeah, the idea was that you, the audience, vote for your favorite pitch and your favorite idea. And you can do so by just um, using our online tool, Mentimeter. Maybe, Julia, you want to share how to use it? Yeah, so uh, you will see very shortly, as soon as Ola shares the screen, a code. You can just type in this with your smartphone, menti.com. This is the website you need to go. And then you should type in the code 224276. And you can vote for the best pitch and the best idea. Best pitch, of course, we refer to the presentation. Best idea to the business idea that you liked better. So on menti.com, the code is 224276. Don't be shy. Try it out. It's amazing. Yes. So now mm -hmm. it's time that we guess how many people are going to vote. Oh, yes. What do you think, Julia? I think 32. Oh, you're very optimistic. What do you think, Philip? I, I'm, I don't know. What is the total number of, of, the, of the audience? I don't see the YouTube channel. Make a guessing. 36 people connected. <laughs> well, then I'll stick with Julia. 32, of course. They're all really, really active listeners. Wow. Martin? Uh, 26. Wow. 
Henry? 28. Uh, Ole, Ole, what do you think? Uh, I wait until I lock it in. The moderator's privilege, it's called. Yeah, yeah. The unfair advantage. The unfair advantage of the moderator. Uh, we have 24 now. So if okay, you so everyone the, stops the, now, the please, please and 20, prove me right. Sorry? Everyone has to stop now in order to prove me right. Yes. Um, I would say it's uh, 25 or how much is it now? 26. Okay, and I say uh, we just lock it in. Oh, we have 30. That was a big, big jump. 31. Wait, can we get to 32? I'll try it and then I'll lock it in. 32. Okay. And the winner of the best pitch, oh, 35. Should oh, we wait wow. for a second? 35 is good. Really good. <laughs> I really appreciate it. 37, 38. And now I lock it in. The winner of the best pitch audience choice award 2020 on this very pitch Tuesday is, is Equity Hub. Congratulations. Oh, we have a banner for this, Julia. We have a banner for this. Yeah, we wait. have. Wait, wait, wait. Let me get to the banner. Uh, here. That was definitely worth it. Yes, if you have banners, you have to use them. So, um, Philip Martin, in the good old tradition of the Oscars, we kindly ask you to uh, share a thank you, an emotional thank you speech with your audience. I am, I am humbled. I'm humbled by your trust. And um, I, I'll, I'll let you know where to send the, uh, the trophy. So, yeah. <laughs> and Martin, you want to say something? As always, the, the the most sincere thanks go to my parents. Oh, that was very emotional. So and we have a second slide here. Let me just check it. Uh, where, why doesn't that work now? Yes, to find out who is the winner of the best idea. Right, but first, I need to find out how this works. OK, let me just get back to it. OK, here and present. I don't know why it didn't work. So, and uh, yeah, we have 30 awards. And for the best idea, the winner is, best idea, the winner, the best idea, the winner is Marine Digital. Congratulations. <laughs> Julia, we need the banner. Bravo. Ivan, wow. Congratulations, your speech. Uh, basically, I think I should improve my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> because you would, you would rather want to win the best pitch award than the best idea award? Maybe you thanks, can negotiate with the two lawyers from Berlin. So congratulations, uh, Ivan. And uh, thank you very much to all of you, to all the startups participating. It was uh, really cool to have you with us and to see how you constantly iterate and improve your business setup. It's really, really fantastic. Um, and thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of our uh, people watching from all over the world. I saw people from Taiwan uh, logging in as well from the UK and uh, from uh, different parts of Germany. It's so cool to know you all around. We do this every Tuesday. So if you want to, then just um, get back to us next Tuesday at 5 p.m. and tell your parents, tell your friends, your peers, your colleagues, they all should watch the Virtual Pitch Tuesday because this is the one event on the net every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also to Julia. It was lovely to present the show. Thanks for your moderation. Thank you, Julia and Ole. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.